before Easter, it was a very long time ago now, I went through uh, the actual project spec for the coursework, which I'm sure you've all been working hard over right on. Um, yeah. Heavy, heavy irony. Yeah, right, fine. Cunning survival trick. Uh, do it before it's due in. <laughs> okay, little pro tip there. Uh, and start early, like a couple of weeks ago, would be good. Um, and uh, don't think you can do it all overnight. I think a few of you discovered that on the previous coursework. Uh, this time it counts again in, in spades, pretty much. So uh, please front load the work, pace yourself. Do not think I'm going to sit down tonight and write it. Instead, think something like, I'm going to sit down tonight and get one element of the deliverable complete and then move on to the next one tomorrow and so on. So that means you can have a steady cadence, a steady beat of achievables. If you get stuck at any particular point, you can get help on that and then move forward. Okay, so the idea is that basically... Um, if you sequence the work and you plan, you'll be fine. If you don't, then uh, your mileage may vary, but it might not always be uh, a good trajectory. What I have is a couple of lectures which uh, basically set out how to uh, get started on the two bits of coursework. Uh, and one of the things that I'd like to come out of these is just how much in common the two applications have, which <coughs> sounds a bit weird but actually makes quite good sense so yeah by now you should be well on with it uh, you should at least have had a crack at it and read the spec and maybe built some bits and pieces in case you aren't then I'm going to present a suggested trajectory to follow this is not the only way to solve the problem it's not the only way that will get you good marks it's not the only structure which will work uh, it's just the one that I came up with, uh, having thought about it for a while, and based on what I've done. So please don't think, that if you've got it working, but it doesn't look like mine, that's a bad thing. It's just a thing. Um, there's lots of different ways. One of the things about writing programs that's important you learn really early is that there's lots of different right ways to do something. Um, uh, and uh, so from that point of view, if your code doesn't look like I'm suggesting or your sequence doesn't work like I'm suggesting, then that's absolutely fine. Um, it just means that you've not done it the same way I have. If yours doesn't work, that's an issue. But if it works okay and it does what the customer wants, then that's fine too. There are some things that I think you really should do, and I'll come to those uh, as we go through. So what I've got there is the, the actual XAML screen design, which I've, I'm giving you for free. If I go back here and drift into Visual Studio, um, it's actually running. Wow, that's impressive. Doesn't do anything. If I go to the actual application, then this is my uh, test application with the XAML in it, and it doesn't really do much. It doesn't work very well, and uh, there's nothing behind any of the buttons, but you do have the entire UI to go at. Now, I've published this the actual XAML all the way from the grid there at the top down to all the stack panels down towards grid at the bottom is this entire display. I would strongly advise that you start from that. If you want to make changes later, that's absolutely fine. Uh, if you want to make, uh, make it look better, that's not much of a challenge, uh, but that's fine too. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit later about how the display fits together uh, and how you should regard the display interactions. But for now, this is a really good starting point. And you can get very high marks if you just implement the thing using this. I'm not going to give any marks for artistic whatever because it's a programming course, not an artistic course. So this will serve as a really good starting point uh, for actually making the code go. So, so please keep that in mind from current slide. Yeah, that'll do. So, yeah, I've given you a nice starting point. Um, 
make good use of that because it's actually uh, been put there specifically for that. Now, I took a look at this and I decided there are a bunch of objects you have to keep track of. Uh, I can think of four, there may be others. Uh, amateur skiers, professional skiers, celebrity skiers and the ski lodge itself. Is everybody okay with the actual problem we're solving here? We've got people turning up to take part in our competition. They're one of those three kinds of skiers. We'll give them um, a competi competitor number and we'll track their name and address and the score that they get. And there's a certain amount of reporting that needs to be done uh, on, on the back of it. Now, if you aren't quite sure where to start, then the bank is a really good place to go to get your head around what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, you can use the account as a pretty good map across to what the skier needs to do, and you can use the bank uh, as a really good ski lodge. You will see this collection throw object pattern all over the place. It even makes an appearance in the, uh, uh, the game that we're making as well. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, the skiers look like a good place for a class hierarchy. Um, if you look at the actual design of the form, which I think I've just closed, then what you have is a bunch of common information which is stored about all of them. If I just fire this up, I can show you what I mean. Is it a good conversation? Can we all join in? You've got basically when you add a new competitor, you give a name and address. Uh, these guys we can worry about a little bit later, but the idea is that there's a, there's a fundamental set of storage which we have to have about a skier, and then we specialise by going for one of these three options. That, to me, smells like a class hierarchy. So we have skier at the top as the abstract, also sorry, the more abstract type of person, then underneath that we drop down to amateur, professional or celebrity. So class hierarchy is, is really a good way to think in terms of attacking that. And so that, that would be in my line. Uh, and we, we start off with skier and then we actually build things in. Now, again, map it across to how the bank works. The bank has, we, we talked about the account being a parent class, and then we had uh, baby accounts and child accounts, other kinds of accounts dropping off that. So this looks to me like a good model to copy. And so we're talking in terms of a class hierarchy here. Um, when you're actually building the thing, on, on a general point, make sure you make it do everything it needs to do. And one of the things I'll bring to your attention, if you haven't already seen it, is this guy. Now, this is something which we've worked very hard on this year. Kevin and myself have been through this several times. Now, when you're being marked, this is what we'll mark you with. This is the technology we're going to use, exactly the same as last year. Uh, we go through the spreadsheet with you. We look for all the behaviours in turn. We give a mark for each of them. And at the end of it, a total drops out. So if you're concerned at all about what the system needs to be able to do, let's go to the right one, then you've actually got a, a checklist which you can actually... Oh, that can go away. You actually have a checklist of, of things which you have to do. Oh, OK. And you can work down this as well as we can. So you can walk into the marking session with a pretty good idea of where you're going to end up. So in terms of behaviours uh, and what the thing needs to do, don't forget the spreadsheet is there to give you help with that. Now I need to get back to my slideshow. Da, 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 da. That's it. So yeah, use that scheme for that. In terms of my suggestion for a sensible trajectory, don't try and make the application all at once. Uh, Build up each app item one at a time and, and see if you can find a way of testing that individually. Uh, this is how we make any kind of complex software system. Um, and so a good starting point is not to kind of dive in, but to think about what kind of sequence you're going to follow. Um, if I was giving advice, 
I would look at this sequence to, to go for, to start with. We know there's the fundamental, which is the actual skier class, and so the first thing I'd do is I'd make that. Uh, and that would just have all the stuff that skiers have. And you can do this by just taking the account class from the bank, renaming it skier, and then sliding all the properties across, should you wish to do it that way. Having done that, I would suggest you go and make the load and the save behaviours for a single skier. So the thing about this is that what we want to do is save all their details and bring them back just like we did with banks and again it turns out we have a bunch of sample code and text in the yellow book that tells you how to do that once you've got load and save working for a single item and you can test this one of the things which I do um, I've done it for you rather nicely here it's I've given you these buttons the red buttons which don't actually uh, they won't make it into the final product they're just there at the moment I click them and they do nothing but if I go into Visual Studio stop the program and just drop down here find this button where are we double click on him there's nothing okay go into properties and add an event handler then let's go in here and add click to them now you've you've all done this kind of thing this is the code that runs when the button gets clicked doesn't have a very sensible name but so I can put a breakpoint here and I can run this up and so now if I hit that button it was the bottom red one I think if I hit clear all data bang it hits that breakpoint and I get control so if I wanted to make some code that actually created a test account and, and did something with it uh, and put it up on the screen so I could see whether it had worked or not that would be a good way to do it. So I can, I can slap a test button on the user interface. I can then get code to run behind that uh, inside the context of my application. Uh, and so I can now think in terms of actually, um, yeah, we could make it do something really simple. Um, if I go into my status thing here. Oh, I have to stop the code first. If I go into my status area there, which is called top three high schools text box which I've given, yes, yeah, a nice good name, isn't it? I like that, it's good. So now in here I can go uh, top three high schools text box dot text equals hello. So now I've got code running and displaying output when that button is pressed, run the program. <coughs> hit the bottom red button, hit the breakpoint, continue on because I'm happy and hello appears in there. So think in terms of doing a little bit of debugging and whatnot in a in a regime a bit like this so if you wonder where wondering where to start from the point of view of okay Rob's giving me the UI what do I do well you want to have something which actually get control when you do something and binding to buttons and doing that ain't a bad way to do it so does that kind of make sense and so the first thing you do is make a uh, go in here and, and make an account class, not account, not account skier class. You pop things into that. You make some test code. If you drill back into the labs that we did a few weeks ago, you'll find we did some testing behaviours for the bank accounts there as well, um, particularly in the, in the context of making test accounts and then doing some fundamental behaviours with them. That code's all should all be lying around somewhere on your hard disk or floppy disk or whatever, probably it's unlikely. Uh, just go dig that out uh, and then away you go. So the idea here is that we can start making little bits of the system and playing with them before we have to tie it all together. Does that make sense? Any questions on this? Has everyone, how many folk have actually started on the project work? Okay, how many folk have finished? Oh, okay, so I'm not wasting your time. A few hands, well done. Uh, I'm not wasting your time here. That, that's, that's all fine. Okay, so that's the kind of process I would go through. So make load and save behaviors for the skier, and then you move back, and then you do the actual ski lodge, which is the container for all my skiers. And so I'll make a load and save behavior for the ski lodge. Now, I'll do that the same way that I do the um, bank. 
in that I'll drift into the bank code, I'll look at the for loop that does that, I'll look at how the save and the load uses streams to do it, I'll tie that all together. Um, once I've got my objects working, now I bind them to the display. So I don't actually do the display binding uh, until after I've actually got them built. I would say, you can do it the other way around. You can have a thing, you can, the first thing we could do, I guess, if you want to do it that way, it's, it's fine, it also works too. You could go in here, you could pull out a button which you find interesting. I would suggest the uh, new, where are we, this guy here. Add competitor. You could put some code behind there that makes one and shoves it somewhere. There's all kinds of ways you could do this, but I tend to get my business objects done first, then I plug them into the display. That's just me. If you do it another way, that's that's absolutely fine. I don't really care. But if you do the UI thing first, then fine. But make sure you put load and save in, because I've seen people take this all the way to the all the way to the end and then find they haven't got load and save working. You have to do all kinds of backtracking and messing around. So I put the load and save stuff in really early on. I do this with both of them. So make your load and save behaviors, bind them to the display, and then, and only then, once you get it working for the skier, then I tend to, I backtracked, and I actually picked up the behaviors for the three different kinds of skier. So at that point, I then came back and went, okay, I've got my skier working. Now I'm going to make it work for the other kinds of skier as well. So I, I just made child classes and did all the glue. And if you read up about baby accounts and stuff, that should all make perfect sense as well. So yeah, here we go. Uh, skier class, uh, drill through the spec, find out what they have to have, add these to the skier class that you're building, give it a constructor which can take these things, um, identify how the property should be used. Um, effectively, you're just doing mostly editing stuff. So you can have getters and setters or make them into properties or do whatever you like to do that. Uh, think about some business rules for validation. Um, I'm not really... Um, well, here's the thing. We shouldn't be able to put an address in which is empty or a name that is empty or a score that's outside the range of scores, um, which I think is just a, a, a number which would be negative. Um, if you do the age extension, Make sure that your age is validated. Um, anyone that's e emailed me about this, I think I said 8 to 80, does that sound about? Or 8 to 70 years old, something like that. So if I don't really care what rules you enforce, as long as you document them and you enforce them. But you'll have to put those things in as well so you can manage stuff happening inside the skier. So you do that, and now we have a skier class that can hold information about our skier. And like I said, you could start with the bank account, and you can slide it across, and, and, and that will serve you very, very well. Once you've done that, save it. Straight away, get the save behavior done and dust it out of the way. Take a look at that slide deck that I put up there, week 26B, because that's got all the code in there that saves a bank and accounts in the bank, and that's a really good starting point. There's a lab that we did that week that also has a lot of useful stuff in there lying around. So create a load method and a save method and test them. Now you can do that behind the red button, press the red button, it makes a skier, saves it, brings it back. What else should you provide as a point of politeness for your skier? A couple of other things I do from an etiquette perspective. Yeah? Confirm that I actually want to save. Yeah, that's... That's a UI thing, so if I press the button saying save, it should say, do you want to save this? I can go with that. I'm thinking more specifically about the skier object itself. What are the things a skier object should do, as well as save and load? I did lecture about these, yeah? Yes, you will want to check that it has been saved correctly. If you want to do that, what method do you have to have in the object to allow you to do that? Need an equals method. If you've saved it and brought it back, you want to check the one you've saved against the one that the original. And equals is your friend for that. So there's equals. What's the other one that goes with equals? Two string. Two string. I want to have a way in which I can take these things into strings. I've been really nice to you because what I've done is I've said, oh, I'll run it up again. Why not? It's pretty. Um, 
I have said that the reports and the details appear in these text boxes. So if you're wondering how on earth do I display the extra information about a celebrity or a professional when we're actually working on it, then the answer is it all appears in this details block here. So what will happen is that you'll hit the find button, type in the number, hit the find, the name and the address come straight out of the object, uh, and the details thing is populated by using two string. So in there it would have the blood type and the next of kin, or it'll have the professional stuff, the sponsor, that'll all appear in there. We don't let them edit that box, we make it read only. So the idea will be that I can see as a professional, or I can see as an amateur, but I can't change it. As far as you're concerned, we don't have an edit behaviour that says changing from one category to the other one. And so effectively what appears in here will be the output from two string for your skier. And we overload that in the child classes to drop out the extra information about them. Does that make sense? Does that make your lives easier? Because it means that you can just drop those in. Um, the same kind of thing for the reports. For the reports, for here, just make a method that calls two string on each of the three winners or whatever they are, and it'll print out whether they're professionals or amateurs or whatnot. Does that make sense? Is that kind of useful? I could have forced you to produce custom displays for each of those, but that's really unpleasant to do uh, and, and not really what we're about. So the idea is that you provide an equals behaviour so we can tell if the things come back the same as it went, and a two-string behaviour so we can look at the thing and bind it into the elements on the display to show the user what it is. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? It's a really easy solution. I mean, you could do it by using switches on, on the type of the object. Uh, you could use it by storing a property that says what type it is. There's ways you could do that. But as far as I'm concerned, a string will work and get you the marks. And that's all we're really fussed about. Questions, comments, observations? If you've done it better than this, then fantastic. But um, if you just want to get something that works, then that's how you do it. And the only thing I've done wrong in my design is I think this will let you change it. Yeah, the details thing will be populated as a read-only field, which you can do. Uh, and at that point, they can see what kind of person he is, but they can't actually make any changes to it. So, get, load and save, and do your tests because you also make an equals behaviour. Uh, and again, we've seen sample code for that all over the place, so it's not a problem. Um, once I've made my child, once I've made my individual objects, now I make my collection. <coughs> so now I'm going to go off and make a ski lodge class that contains a dictionary. Why a dictionary? what it says. Why a dictionary? Because I want to find these guys. I want to type in their number uh, and we can find the details for that particular person. I need to do that uh, to give them the score and edit their details and whatnot. And so a dictionary is perfect for this. So effectively I'll put a dictionary in there. As far as you're concerned you can treat skier number as a count number. They are so close as to make no real difference. A ski lodge will create the uh, skier numbers and allocate them for you. Um, the skier itself will store this, that's fine, but it won't generate them. But it's the same pattern we use for banks, uh, and uh, so you can map all that across, and that should just work. There's a few sort of toughish bits in, in, the, um, in the coursework. Saving the, the entire ski lodge save and load is a bit of a pain. You have to do that. But you can steal the bank code that we did last time that we actually used to make the bank save and load. Uh, and again, there is a requirement and a red button and it's in the spec to provide test behaviour. So if I go into here and I look down the generate reports, load and save, form validation, data tools... There's some test stuff as well, I believe it should be. So make sure that you've got some kind of way of testing it that doesn't involve typing everything in.
Again, lift the stuff from the previous labs that we've done. Reuse that code if, if you like. Once you've done that, then once I've got my underpinnings going, then I wire it up. And so when I hit find, hit the find button, it fetches the number that the person's typed in, it feeds that into the ski lodge and says, can you find me a skier with this number, please? The ski lodge comes back with either a null saying, no, he's not here, or yes, here he is, at which point you take all the properties out of that guy and put them onto the edit item. You take his two-string, you drop it in the details pane, and you're done. If they hit save, yes, maybe you put a confirmation dialog box that's saying, are you going to save this thing? If the answer is yes, then you take the values out of the text boxes and you put them back into the currently active skier. Make sense? You could get really clever. You, when they hit the save button, you could detect if there have been any changes. In other words, have they actually altered the content of any of the text boxes? If they have, then we give the confirmation. If they haven't, we just move on because sometimes the customer will just be viewing details. So you could do that. That's a nice piece of enhancement. Um, if they hit add, then you read stuff out of the add pane and you make a new skier, which you then connect into the ski lodge. Um, one of the things that I have done with the design is that you can treat each of these three columns as a particular specific use case. So this guy is concerned with editing, this guy is concerned with introducing new items, and this guy is concerned with report generation. That is not accidental. You could basically you want to do those as, as uh, tab dialogue, then that's fine too. But you can treat each of these three things as a particular separate sequence of actions. Um, if you hit the reports button, then the spec says what the reports need to do. So, so off you go. Remember that we want the two test buttons working as well, create test data and clear all data. Um, you can make a, a bunch of skiers, uh, and uh, you can also wipe clean the lodge uh, using a couple of uh, methods to do that. Again, go back and look at the coursework we've done already the, the, because it's, it's all in there. Once you've got those going, then what I did next, this was the kind of sequence which I followed. It, it worked for me. I then put the children in. So now I extend the skier class and I make myself my amateur, my professional, and my celebrity. Now it turns out that the amateur doesn't really have anything extra, but I still made one just in case in future we need to add anything else into, into there to, to keep track of amateurs specifically. Um, the other wrinkle that you'll have to deal with is that when you save and load these items, you have to save the type of each item. Now, the way that works is that when the ski lodge is going through saving all the objects, it'll actually pull out the type name and save that as a text line. So when it's reading it back, it will then go, OK, this next guy is a skier, therefore I'll construct him as a skier. Oh, this, this chap here is an amateur. I'll do him as an amateur. He's a celebrity, blah, blah, blah. Now, there's a, a little piece of trickery. Um, have you seen this? You probably haven't, actually. I, I should show you this. Let's just make a new class, new project. Make it a console app. It's not in Visual Basic, is it? No? OK. Is uh, a demo. And we'll put it on the desktop, not in some other strange place. OK, brand new empty program. Two minutes is an account. Oh, I'm mistyping in front of an audience. OK, so now I can go... Uh, make me a new account. What have I just done? Made an account class. OK, I could go object... O equals new object. Yay! Okay, so I've got an object called O and an account called A. If A, haha, 
A is count. Console dot right line count count. So if I run this program, it will print out the word account. If you don't believe me, watch. <laughs> Yay, there it is. If I change that to O, will it print account? Let's see. Nope, nothing at all. Is is the first it's our first step. I'll be, I'll be covering this a bit later but I'll, in the course because we talk about reflection a bit later on but I'm mentioning it now because it might be useful in this context is is our first experience of what's called reflection uh, reflection is a programming technique where the code itself can make decisions based on the type of data it's working with uh, it can ask itself questions about the objects it's working with and behave in different ways uh, and uh, it's an interesting business um, if you're wondering how do I know if this skier that I've got is an amateur or a professional or a celebrity? The answer is you can use is because is is a new C sharp key we haven't seen before. On the left hand side you have a reference, on the right hand side you have a type. If that reference refers to an object of that type, then is comes back true. So I can ask in my program, am I about to save a skier? If I am, I'll write the word skier into the file and I'll call the save on it. If I'm about to save an amateur, it'll write, I can detect which one to write and then write amateur and so on and so forth. There are other ways you can do it. You can use different kinds of introspection to find the type of an object and then find its type name. That also works. But I thought I'd start off by showing you is. Does is make sense? I can ask an object, hey, what type are you? And it will tell me. And so, O oh, isn't an object, we don't say, isn't, a, isn't an account. Um, here's the thing. Here's a question. Why is that a stupid test? Yeah? Because everything in your program is an object. So asking, are you an object, is a bit crackers because everything's an object. So that thing will always be true. I'm wondering if I actually knot it. Can I knot the thing like that? I'll put it in, a, put it in brackets like this. I'm wondering if the compiler will figure out whether it's un, that that's unreachable code. No, it's not smart enough. Uh, the, the compiler doesn't actually know that one but as far as we're concerned O is object is a very stupid piece of code because it's never false everything in my program has object as the parent so everything is an object only some objects are accounts because account extends the object class and in the case of our professional celebrity amateur whatever there'll only be those types as well so you can use that trick all through your code if you like to find out what type you're dealing with and then behave in a specific way. Does that make sense? So is is your friend, which is kind of nice. Uh, and so, yeah, um, take a look in the yellow book. The yellow book covers all this, and I think it's towards the end, about page 170 or so. It's all in here about how you save different types. In terms of how you solve the problem, yeah, very keen on this. Find a way of making each element individually have a plan to do that think about what you're going to build in turn before you start building the whole thing um, do you folks use source code control do you know what source code control is? Hang on up. do you know what source code control is 
have you ever been in a situation where you've made some changes from the code, totally broken it, and you have no way back? Not even Control Z can get you out. You keep on Control Zing until it goes back to how it was. Um, you should never put yourself in that position because you should be working on a copy of which you pulled out of your repository somewhere. So that the, if the worst happens, the worst worst case scenario, you can always get back. Now, when I was learning years ago. I learnt on punch cards, which are cards with holes punched in them. And source code control for us was making sure you didn't lose your punch cards, which was quite interesting. But we did have a machine that you could sometimes use to copy one deck of cards and make another one exactly the same. So I could try working on one deck of cards differently, which is it's kind of weird because in those days your program was a physical thing that you carried around in your bag with you as a pile of punch cards. Quite interesting. Anywho. You don't have that limitation. Worst case, before you start building something, right-click on the folder where it lives, pull down, zip to, and make a, just zip the whole thing up into an archive, and then crack on and play with it. And if you go through your project with a steady stream of zip archives, <coughs> then that's fine by me, because it gives you a way back. Just keep on giving them different names. Um, you should be using source code control, but Please do that if you're not on, at least make zip, zipped up copies or something because you really don't want to actually take a step and break everything. But you keep the steps very small. I'll, I'll play, for the, play with the code for half an hour, then see if it works, and then play with the code for half an hour. Uh, and the other one which is really, really important and which students, this is an absolute first year student classic, don't run away from one problem that you can't solve and try and find another one that you can't solve instead. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, I can't do this, so I'll try and do a thing which is more difficult and see how that goes. Um, it's not going to go well. Keep the focus on what you're trying to achieve, and if you get stuck, step back and try and figure out why you're doing it. What am I, what am I, why am I messing up? What, what's this skier supposed to do? And if you keep on with that, you'll be absolutely fine. This is particularly the case with extras. Don't think I can't get the skier to load and save, so I'll add the age value to it. That's bound to help, right? No. And what's worse, and you need to remember this as well, if you don't get the program to perform with the key behaviours, all the marks for extras disappear. So don't think you can get out of missing functionality by adding extra bits. It ain't going to work. And if you come and see me and tell me that you're absolutely baffled, uh, please, uh, I much prefer someone coming and saying, how do I make it save the skier or bring it back? Or I've got this code here that doesn't quite work and I'm not sure why. That I like. I can help you then. What I don't like is, what do I do? Particularly if it's the day before it's due in. Okay, because that, that indicates uh, a lack of planning and foresight. It's actually, um, it's quite steady stuff, this. You'll be absolutely fine if you start around now uh, the head and work continuously uh, 12 hours a day. You should have it just about done by, uh, by early May. You never know. Now, the, please, the, the thing I would say, though, is if you do get stuck, please let me know. Uh, please make good use of the forums. Um, I, I will make a habit of, of going down there and checking, but worst case, ping me an email or come and hammer on the door. Some members of staff have things stuck on the door saying when they're available. I've not bothered with that because basically if I'm sat in the office, I'm available. So don't worry about disturbing me. I'd much rather uh, give you some help now and make sure that you can get somewhere than have uh, lots and lots of resits and rework to do in, uh, in August. So, yeah please have a plan and then actually work at that uh, and then come along and see me uh, if it starts to deviate. Uh, the old, the previous labs you've done are a really good place uh, to actually sort of find out more. I think that's pretty much the end for that one. I'll do the same thing at 5.15 for the um, the video game, the, the actual ski one. Does anyone have any questions? Um, yeah. Shh, 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 shh. Not done yet. Not done yet. Yeah. Question. When you're smithing, you need to one version. So if you do, you need to one version with approvals, or a version without approvals and a version with approvals. 
Good question. The question is, if you're submitting and you've got add-ons, do you do, do you submit both versions? I would just submit the one. Yeah. Uh, and what we'll what we'll we'll do, we actually have got in the marking scheme there are call-outs for the various bits and pieces. So just submit the one. Otherwise, it gets confusing which you really mean. Okay, Any other questions? Okay, I'll see you at 5.15 then. <laughs>